if you are not proud of yourself, then why 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 would somebody want to be like you? I remember right. one time I was interviewing a guy, it's a very intelligent person here in Italy. I was working about one of my documentaries then about Pan-Africanism. And then he was telling me, of course, in reaction to one of my questions, talking about uh, religion, that if you have a horse, you leave your horse on the ground and you are riding the horse of another person, don't come around and start complaining, oh, my horse is left on the ground. No, you were the one that left your horse there. If you wanted to ride it, you could have, you could have, you could have stayed on top, you know? So, so it, we, right. we have a huge responsibility here as a people to uphold our culture. Just like, for example, like you said, you take the, what you are wearing on your, on your head to demonstrate, to make a message. You are you are signaling something out for the people that are watching you. Because there's somebody going to come around and ask you, what does that mean? That gives you the time to be able to explain, this is my culture, this is what it represents, and all that. Now, having said that, I just want to ask another question still within mm -hmm. the United States, and this time I'm talking about the educational system. Mm -hmm. Now, when you go to school, what kind of message do you hear, do you have about Africa? Because now that you have gone to school, you are expected to know certain things. When you finish school in U.S., what are you supposed to know about Africa? Well, um, it's, it's disappointing, and I think the, the look on my face lets you know that, you know, as far as the very colonized, very European mindset that is given to the Western educational system. In about 30 years, if we don't change something, I don't think the kids will even know Africa exists. I don't even think they'll know it. I think they'll know that people of color exist, but for all they know, we're probably Cuban or, or you know, from the Caribbean or something. They won't even assimilate this color to the African continent. Um, they will assume and assert that we're some Aboriginal people that just, you know, showed up on, on this planet and we're just here. You know, there won't be an assimilation to Africa because they won't admit to the truth of who we are. We are the first people. Everybody came from us. Every single race, creed, color, population has come from this skin. Every one of them. They cannot admit that out loud because they will almost simultaneously admit defeat to what they are wanting to see as this supremacy. Um, so they can't admit that. They can't admit it out loud. And they definitely are not trying to incorporate that in their educational system so their children will figure it out. So they're trying to lay dormant the things that we do. They will suppress our inventions. They suppress the fact that 99.9% .9 of the things that we use today has been built, constructed, or invented by a, a Black hand. Um, I used the, 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 the adage of the cotton gin. Um, they say Eli Whitney uh, invented the cotton gin. Eli Whitney was a, a slave owner. Why would he think to make the job of his slaves easier? Eli Whitney didn't invent a cotton gin. It was a slave of his that invented the cotton gin to make his job easier. But Eli Whitney had the money for the patent. And whoever has the money and submits the patent is the inventor. So how that part of history was erased was, it says, if you read your history books, the current ones, Eli Whitney created the cotton gin or invented the cotton gin. Technically on paper, he did invent the cotton gin because he paid for the patent. But it was a slave of his that created and invented the cotton gin and actually built the first model. Eli Whitney took it from that slave because he thought that the slave was, was too ignorant to understand the power of what he had. He marketed it and sold it to other slave owners. So Eli Whitney goes into history as being the cotton gin master. He invented the cotton gin and now you, know, you can bale hay in record time. Now you can get 50 bales of hay in one day versus four bales of hay. So now you can do uh, 25 bales of cotton instead of three bales of cotton. So it's looked upon as this European man is this inventor. And this goes on in other things. The light bulb, the, um, the light bulb was not um, um, Edison. Uh, Thomas Edison did not invent the light bulb. He, he created the patent. It was a black man that invented the filament and he actually was African. He was um, from, Ghana, uh, um, from Ghana, his ancestry was from Ghana and he created the filament. Thomas Edison um, was the one that helped in the blowing of the glass that covers the light bulb. But the light bulb itself, the filament, what we actually need and use was invented by a man of color. So just those two simple uh, examples of what it is that we did as people has been lost in history 
based on who's writing the book. So one of the things that I have learned in my, my going forward is that we need to start telling the story. The, the, the story of the gazelle will always be lost to the lion. Why? Because he's the only survivor. And the story of the gazelle is always that he is the victim. But it's never told that most of the gazelles get away from the lion's grasp. So we as people of color need to begin to start telling our story. Tell our story. You know, the griot people, the, where I'm from, we're actual storytellers. And we are, we are people that were, were given the talent of being storytellers so that our story was never lost. But you didn't even know that. You didn't know that the griot people were storytellers because that part of our lineage has been lost to westernization. The Fula people have great stories to tell. But now if you look at the history, if you look at the current situation in Nigeria and parts of Ghana and even in um, parts of, of West Africa, there are Fulas that are taking over and doing the wrong thing. So saying I'm Fulani in this day and age is a bad thing right now. But to say that I'm Fulani as a people has its lineage and history. And all I'm saying in the givings of this is that we have to know who we are and where we're from in order to tell the proper story. We can't use the westernization. We can't use colonialization. We can't even use current events to even authenticate who we are. Because what we're doing is having someone else tell our story. And that's where we go the most wrong. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you more than 100%. If I, that is why we are here, because we need to challenge the system we need to challenge the yeah. situation also because other before us has done this that is why we will have and uh, have a place to even stand at otherwise if it were possible they would have cancelled out completely you know so it is very important that if you are singing use that as a medium if you are writing use that as a medium if you are talking use that as a medium no one can tell your story for you it doesn't happen it have never happened it will never happen all right, now looking at the potential that we have as a people, the possibility that we have as a people looking at the African diaspora, I'm now looking at it from the point of view also of business because that is something that is hardly talked about among the African diaspora. When we, right. when we begin to analyze the situation or when some other persons try to analyze it, is the question of money. Someone somewhere is always in charge of the money circulation within the community. And this, and uh, somehow, this person they end up controlling the community. But now there is a new wave of thinking that maybe we need to follow the money because that is actually where the secret is. Now, if we are to look at this from this perspective, I'm thinking, I'm seeing that if the Africans in the diaspora can continue to can begin to do businesses among themselves, because we have huge amount of Africans. In, in Brazil, for example, in the Caribbean, in other parts of the world, in Europe, we don't need to believe the narration that we are different. We are not different. So I want you to speak to the possibility that we have in terms of networking together in the area of business. Okay. Great question. <clears throat> there is a word that I use in this, this theme, and it's called gentrification. And if you quickly Google gentrification, it's when it's, it's synonymous to someone else coming into your neighborhood, taking whatever they have that's available to take and then rezoning it to what it is that they want. So it's like someone coming into your household and they renovate, let's say your bathroom, the smallest area in your house. They renovate your bathroom and because they renovated your bathroom, they now go down to the, the courthouse and they try to buy your home. And they use the fact, well, I changed your bathroom, so now I'm taking ownership of your whole house. You would look at them and be like, what are you talking about? You just, you just, you just fixed my bathroom. What are you talking about buying my house? I'm taking your house. Well, I mean, I fixed your bathroom, so if I bettered your bathroom, then I have to give claim to that. That's mine now. You, you, you're looking at them crazy. Well, that's what's happening. That gentrification and that mindset is actually happening in the people of the diaspora to include those of us in the West. We have taken a cultural gentrification. We have gone in and we've claimed the African side of us because it sounds royal and it sounds right. And it sounds like we are doing something in society and we're claiming something that we didn't have. And we're turning it into owning something that's not ours. 
just because I was born in the United States doesn't mean I can go back to Africa and just start shape shifting everything. Or I go back to Africa and I think, oh, well, I'm just going to go back to, to the Gambia and I'm just going to be the mayor next year. Okay, wait a minute, hold on. How are you just going to go into another country? I know I was born there. I mean, I was born in the United States and I'm from the Gambia, but you just can't just go into another country and just start shape shifting. That's what has happened when we give too much power to too many people that don't belong. And this is where I bring in that gentrification where we allowed people that really didn't belong in that place. We gave them a little power and now they took over and it's not their fault. They only did what we allowed. We allowed too many people that we knew were not good with money to handle our money. We allowed too many people that we knew were not for the people to be in governmental positions. We allow that. We allow that because they patted us on the back or they kissed our baby or, or they gave us $500 more in our check that month or, or they told us, they promised us that they were gonna make our life a little better. So we believed them because they cried or because they stood there with their wife or, or something that made us feel good about it. But really they were crooks when they came into office. So I really don't blame them because it's like a snake's theory. A snake is gonna bite you whether you, you found it in an egg or you raised it until it was 50 years old, it's still gonna bite you because it's in his nature. So you can't blame the crooks for being crooked. You have to see where your responsibility and your alliance lies. You knew who they were when they came into office. You knew the legacy that they came from. You knew who they supported in their lineage. You knew what ancestry they came from as far as what they promoted. So why would you vote them into office? Why would you allow them to be on the most precious thing that you have, which is your commodity, the only thing that you have left in the government, which is your own commodity, your money, your resources, and your, your natural and human resources, and your legacy, which is your land? Why would you allow that? So now we say, oh, well, there's you know, lesser of two evils when we deal with the politics. Okay, then create your own. Why do we have to give credence to what's there? Why don't we create our own? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with stepping up and using the integrity that you have in your own community and use that to better the, the, the community at large? What's wrong with that? I don't see that there's a reason. When I go back to the Gambia, once my children are finished having children and I, I can rest now, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the Gambia permanently. And I know I'm going to be in the community and I know I'm going to be in the society, but I'm not gonna go there and a year later I'm running for president. No, you got to get in there and you got to learn the people, learn what they want, start giving it before the title, start doing for the people to show them who you are, and then allow whatever it is that transgresses to be your, your ethic, to be your lineage and be your legacy. And then you won't even have to run for office. People will put you in office because they know who you are. So we have to start taking back our power, taking back the, the people that are garnering the things that we love the most. And we have to start allowing the people that we know are to be true and right and put them into the offices to protect who we are. And once we start doing that, you'll be surprised how this, this, this whole dynamic will shift. <music>